Well, I'm very honored to introduce our speaker today, um, Candy Finnegan. She's one of my dear friends and mentors for a long time, and I'm glad she's here. Miss uh, Candy Finnegan is a nationally recognized addiction specialist, interventionist, and author. She received her certification in addiction dependency from UCLA and did her internship at Cedar sinai Hospital, where she worked in addiction services. She was certified to treat sex addiction and codependency by Dr. Patrick Carnes and is a board certified registered interventionist, receiving her intervention training from the developer of the process, Dr. Vern Johnson. She also has the honor of being on the Emmy award-winning A&E television show, Intervention. Candy's involvement with the American Adoption Congress stems from her personal interest in adoption and addiction issues. Help me welcome Candy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I did it. She probably should have just told a bad story about me. I know, uh, you have told a bad story, but yes, let's this say, is CEU. we've been <laughs> awfully good friends. Well, well, hi everybody. Thank you so much. Thanks, thank you, Doctor, for uh, inviting me. And uh, I know you sound busy. <laughs> about as busy as me. Um, I'm a tad bit spaced. I have to tell you, I don't know why I thought this was the 18th, but um, so. Lovely Candy Carlson and I flew in at like left at Utah at 6:45 this morning too. <coughs> so I got dressed in the conference room. I couldn't decide whether to get dressed or to lay down in it. You know, I was like, <laughs> tired, tired. But um, you know, it's um, it's funny. I'm in my uh, I just celebrated 25 years of sobriety, and um, you know, as I have gone on this journey, I, and gone to school and done whatever I was supposed to do to be able to, um, I guess, be recognized as an expert. There was always this little part of me that, um, that I, I don't think it was a dirty little secret by any means, but I felt that um, it separated me from everybody else just a little bit more. And um, um, I was adopted at birth. Um, I was adopted into a very privileged family in Kansas and uh, always said, uh, look what your parents got stuck with. My parents got to choose me. So, and I think that they regretted it on a lot of weekends. Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, I was probably 12 or 13 years sober before I ever even talked about being adopted. And you know, on a twelve-step pitch, it just didn't seem like it was an important part of my story. Um, where the fact of it is, is any child that's adopted, it's kind of the beginning of the story, you know. And uh, so I had, um, I had uh, was so actually with uh, Josie and. Um, on my way up to visit a treatment center in Astoria Point, Oregon, and um, there were three of us in the car, and April Peters, who, who just uh, left, um, who's with Interchange. Um, she was in the car, I was in the car, and another woman was in the car, and then an MFT, who's one of my best friends. And I don't know how we got on this whole discussion, but we started talking about not belonging when we were younger, and. You know, she's considerably younger than I am, like 30 years. And uh, she said, you know, my mom was adopted. Um, and I spent my whole life trying to mother her. And I didn't find out she was adopted until after she got killed in a car accident. She was, uh, she died drunk and um, uh, had been abused by the first adopted family and then readopted. And she said, when Someone got up to speak at my mom's funeral. They said she hadn't had an easy life. And, you know, April said, well, I knew that she had untreated alcoholism and it affected all of us kids. But she said, and this woman said, she was thrown away over and over again by um, the foster care system and then finally got adopted and was abused and then sent back to the system and then adopted again. And, you know, April had never talked about it because she felt so kind of shamed that this was her mother, you know? And of course her mother didn't know how to really mother. And um, that she spent her whole life trying to figure out, you know, what was kind of 
not ever there when it had to come to maternal affection. And um, um, she would always tell her kids, you know, nobody's going to come and get you. And I thought, how could you have not asked what that meant? But, you know, we go through life with blinders on to protect ourselves. Now, I am... Um, I had an intervention done by my um, mother-in-law, who had a black belt in Al-Anon. <laughs> <laughs> she was also like six foot uh, one, and uh, a Kelly. So, um, and um, she had retired and um, had come to stay. My husband's from Ohio, and had come to stay. Um, at our house, and the truth is, I got caught. You know, she'd say to me, why are you lacking the bathroom door when you bathe the kids? And I'd go, well, I don't want anybody to come in the house. She said, nobody's coming in the house, Candy. Well, I, you know, I had to lock the door because I drank when I bathed my kids, and the wine was behind the toilet uh, tank because there's cool water, and it was perfect temperature. And um, <laughs> although my son always said, you just need to call a plumber, because <laughs> he'd hear that thing go up and down all the time. So, um. Um, so in the process of having her catch me, thank God, um, she called my parents, asked my parents to be a part of this, and my mother and dad, well-trained as they were, of course, said these words, it's not her, it's your son. She goes, oh, well, we're not going to talk about him. <laughs> you know, he's not taking care of the kids. So, um... She said to me, I'm going to give you a small amount of time. You can do whatever you want to, but if this isn't done by the end of school, the kid's school, she came at uh, a little bit before Christmas and left after Easter, and uh, Easter was really late that year. <laughs> <laughs> Way into April. And um, um, she said, when, by the time the kids get out of school, she said, I want you to have made a, not made a conscious decision to get help for yourself, but have helped yourself. And, uh, oh my God, it was like, ooh, that wasn't very much time. And um, I think she gave me 60 days. I really can't remember, but I think it was on the 61st day because I am an alcoholic and it's going to be my decision. And... Um, but what got my attention was, is that she said, I'm going to take your kids. They're my grad kids. I don't want them raised by um, an alcoholic mother. My, um, my father-in-law had uh, come from an alcoholic family. You know, the kind you hear about in stories where you come home from school and they've moved. <laughs> you know, those kind. Brother went out to get a loaf of bread, never came back, you know. Uh, got, went to a bar, I guess, and <laughs> forgot his way home. Um, so, you know, she knew the effects that it had. She was a social worker. She was the bailiff. She was the welfare investigator, the divorce investigator. And one of her, you know, in a small town in Ohio, um, Miami County, right outside of, between Dayton and Cincinnati, and her claim to fame was she'd set the alarm at 1 o'clock in the morning and go out to the bars and see which moms were out there drinking. And then all hell broke loose. She was very early, um, actually in the late 50s, early 60s, she was one of the first people that gave the children to fathers that were hardworking and uh, said, you know, you're not going to kill the kids as long as you're killing you. And uh, I know they didn't like seeing her come in that bar. I didn't like her seeing her come to my house. So, uh, but I have to tell you, by the grace of God and um, that she was smart enough to get a program, she couldn't have said anything else in the world to me. She could have said, you have to go back to Kansas. Eh, well, I would have. You, have, you can leave my son. Eh, I would have. Um, you can, uh, I don't know, lose your house, your car, your life. But all she had to, all she had to say to me is, I'm going to take these kids. And nobody was going to take my kids, you know. Um, and years later, when I talk and tell my own story, I had um, the privilege of um, going up to uh, Sunrise, which is a girls' um, therapeutic school in uh, Utah, and uh, talking to a bunch of girls, and they 
put on after wonderful consultation with um, uh, with the whole interchange facility. Now, Dustin is the president of it. His wife is adopted. They have two adopted kids. John is head of New Haven. John is adopted. John and his wife have adopted a kid. So, you know, it's this group of people who have come together to have these therapeutic schools for these girls, and they put on an adopted track. And um, because it was astounding that between 38 and 45 percent of all of the girls that came in there were adopted. Some, um, I would say the majority of them, were not um, out of country adoptions. And I, you know, for me, I just, I mean, I, I, I guess because of the way the world looks now, I don't ever think about um, that there's still adoption available. You know, I think the Catholic Church is kind of been concentrating on something else other than unwed mother's homes. So, because um, that was the majority of the place that really happened, you know, where, who had the best, you know, um, homes to help girls um, that got into trouble. So, I was sitting talking to this girl and she said to me, when did you start drinking? And I said, oh, I started drinking right after I had my daughter. And I thought, I don't think I ever said that before. I'm not sure I ever realized it before. So when I started looking at my, my alcoholism, the drinking alcoholically, the getting into recovery, um, and the work that I've done in the last 25 years, I would have to tell you that um, Adoption and addiction are very similar in so many ways. I mean, I felt exactly, when I walked into the rooms of the 12 step and somebody said to me, um, oh, you get to pick your own family. And I went, aha, that's the concept. And um, you get to, um, you have a hole in your soul and you um, aren't pretty enough or tall enough or whatever it is. That's what I felt like since I was a tiny girl. And I'd never had a drink. But when I came into Alcoholics Anonymous, for me, I thought that I'd always had alcoholism, which I probably have, but um, that perfectionism, that uh, um, um, that such incredible control issues, you know, not about big things, but little things, like um, um, I have to go first, you know. Um, somebody leaves, how long are you going to be gone? I mean, I, my, I used to make my mother write a note when she was going to be home. Well, my God, if she had one extra martini and decided to stay at the club, you know, I would panic. And I certainly wasn't home alone, trust me. But um, I was always afraid that they would never come back. You know, it was just that kind of mentality. They never said, this is my daughter Candy and she's adopted. They never said, um, uh, look, how, look what we picked out. <laughs> Trust me, they never did that. Um, <laughs> but adoption back in those days, um, my parents spent seven weekends going and looking at little red-headed girls to adopt. There was, you know, it was uh, the late 40s, and it's, um, I, <laughs> that's so bizarre to me. I can't, it's like, I said it's like a bad tomato. Um, <laughs> and uh, I don't know except by, you know, a power greater than me. I, my dad picked me up and I um, tinkled all over him. And he said, aha, I'll take her. <laughs> and uh, I said, and I, you were pissed off at me for the rest of my life. So, um, you know, it's um, what a horrible way to try to, you know, um, make up. My parents had lost two children in six months. They lost a biological daughter at seven years from pyloric polio and uh, they had lot and then my mother had had a stillborn so um, I always felt like a replacement child um, but it was never said you know I mean it was all these things that I conjured up um, for myself and so when I had my own children which I wasn't big on unfortunately my biggest regret is that I never adopted a child but <laughs> you got it's like adoption before addiction and I was doing addiction. I was doing um, alcohol and drugs at that point and couldn't get the paperwork done. I mean, you know, needless to say, have them do a home visit. <laughs> no, thank you. Um, uh, so 
I think that so many things in the last three or four years have come to light. And in the process of that, um, my, my adopted mother died. And um, I was told at a very young age, I, you know, I, I just don't have, I just can't remember. And there wasn't anybody else in the room but the two of us. And I kept saying, um, I don't ever remember threatening her, but that could be my own brain. Um, like, if you don't like me, I'm going home, back to where you got me from. Um, and uh, I don't think that that ever came up, but I do remember really in a very split second, my mom turning around to me and saying, Candy, you have to give up on all that. Right after we adopted you, your, it was always birth mother, your birth mother died. And that was it, was never mentioned again. And I was four or five. I remember talking to my dad about it. My dad would never rat on my mother. My parents were lovely people. And I have to tell you, uh, he was so stunned when I said it to him. He went, who told you that story? I said, mom did. She, he goes, oh, <laughs> like, how'd that come out? It was probably because I was driving her crazy, knowing me as I do. And uh, so uh, at, uh, right after my, the uh, funeral of my mother, my cousin walked in with a piece of paper that said, uh, give to candy after my death. And it was dated September 25th, 1960. So between, I don't know, the early 50s and the 60s, she had put in a safety deposit box that, by the way, she paid for for 50 years. I mean, this is Kansas. It's a rock tornadoes. I mean, I thought, how do you know it's still going to be here? Um, and my cousin handed it to me, and it was all my adoption papers. And um, to the best of my knowledge, um, she didn't die, and her name was Bennigan. I thought that was, once you're Irish, you're always Irish. These Kellys are up here. Um, and um, it was so eerie for me to see. Um, I have never gone to find um, my birth mother. Listen, the mother that I had and the mother that I am, I've had enough. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, you know, my, of course, my daughter's uh, um, in her early 30s and is becoming a nurse, and she's going, oh, we have to know genetically what's wrong with this and every disease we have. And I said, I'm 63 years old. Whatever the hell's the matter with me is the matter with me. I don't want to blame anybody else, and I'm not going to go looking for it. So if you want to do it when I'm dead, go right ahead. She goes, but they'll be dead. And I said, I, they might be dead now. <laughs> um, and, you know, I, it isn't that I, I have to be so honest with you. I just don't have the curiosity. Um, and I am. I want to know where you got your shoes. But I don't know what I don't necessarily want to know where I came from. Um, I just think that God has blessed me in so many ways, and I am such a happy woman, and I just, it, it could either be fabulous or it could be horrible. And, you know, um, after you've been in recovery as long as I have, I really like the middle. I used to like all that, but I just thought, life is good. Why? My daughter always says, we'll get together and we'll just put it in the computer the day you were born. And, and now we know you. And I go, no, we're not. You know, I'm shocked she hasn't done it. I said, you know, they'll all probably be on Facebook. Just what I want to do. You know, <laughs> oh, I just found out I was adopted. This is where I'm from. And so 700 Bennigans come up, you know. I thought, and nah, I don't want to do that today. But um, I got involved with the... Um, uh, the Association of Adoption Congress, and the reason it's called Congress is that there's still seven states that uh, do not have open adoptions, and one of them is Kansas. So, so grateful. I don't ever want it to pass. Um, and my daughter will be down there in 20 minutes. Um, but, you know, it's that type of situation where um, when I went to this Congress two years ago, I was the first person that ever talked about addiction. And 85%, the 85% uh, figure of um, an adopted, if adopted at birth or within two years, 
there's an 85% chance they're going to have an addiction or an affliction that, um, that they have to control. And we all know about controlling addiction, so that didn't work. So um, I started kind of getting involved with it and... Um, you know, we're all into, you know, um, a lot of the neurosciences and the brains. And, you know, if you aren't coddled by your biological mother, you have a, a much more of a, of a fight and flight. I mean, it goes, it goes so way on out that I never wanted to even know about it. That, um, that everybody else is incredibly interested in. And I am too, just because, you know... Um, 45% of all women that give up male babies and they're between the ages of 15 and 19 have secondary infertility and never have another child. Now, is this information that I ever thought that I needed or that I even never thought was out there? Absolutely not. But when I got into this Congress and started looking at it, all the birth mothers were over here pissed and in the bar. All the adopted mothers were over here pissed because the other kids wanted to know who their birth mothers were. And all the peeps, as they call themselves, who were in the middle, were all planning their next 12-step meeting. And um, there were people who were still looking for their mothers that were my age. And there were kids that were 18 and 19 years old. And... Um, I've been to a lot of addiction conferences in my 25 years. I have to tell you, I walked out of there so tired because it's this frantic environment of where did I come from and who do I look like? And then, you know, mothers would have found their adopted babies and they would bring them, whom they're now 52, by the way, and, um, um, but they were still her babies. And I mean, it's so similar to the unresolved issues of addiction that I became really fascinated with it and um, I uh, I went online I guess in the spring and pulled up a lot of the treatment center people in this room and there is an any thing on any intake one that says were you adopted or did you ever come through foster care now, I'm not saying that we don't find this information out in the treatment world, because when you start saying, so genetically, do you have heart thing, high blood pressure and diabetes, usually the first thing you hear is, I don't know, I'm adopted. So basically all you think is you just mark it off, adopted. But I'm not sure that anybody ever thinks about that that's where it all started. And we've come so far in believing that trauma is such a big part of addiction and um, I uh, I remember the first time somebody said to me, so you were abandoned as a baby? And I went, no, I wasn't. Yes, you weren't. No, I'm, yes, you weren't. No, I was. They said, yes, you were abandoned. And I said, no, because that to me is a really lovely laundry basket with a little pink bumpy in it. It's me in the front of the Catholic Church. That's what abandoned looks like to me. Um, but when you start talking about um, early childhood trauma, I'd have to say that you have to use the word abandonment. Um, and um, I think that for an adopted person, um, you have such a responsibility to these people who saved you from living a life in an orphanage kind of like Annie. I will, and that show so bothered me. Um, the, sun will come, the sun will come out tomorrow. Um, you know, I mean, it's like, and I, you know, I have to be honest with you, I didn't tell my kids that I was adopted because I thought they would love my husband's family more than mine. And oh my, there we go with the mother-in-law again, had a fit. And uh, she got my kids Cabbage Patch dolls and wrote to the Cabbage Patch Company, now this is a broad, <laughs> said, look, I've got these grandkids and they don't know their mother, you know, could you add adoption papers into those things? And they did. And so um, she actually was good friends with one of the original creators of the dolls. And um, 
So that's how I told my kids I was adopted, is I gave them cabbage patch dolls. This looks just like Annie. You know, a little stubby, but you know, it's, um, but you know, it, I can't tell you the tool that it's been used, you know. Um, and then this word rescue started coming, rescue dogs and rescue this, you know. And I thought, my, we used to say adopted dogs, you know, because nobody wants them and they're gonna kill you. I thought, oh, brother. So this is still trauma that's living with me. And, um, you know, it's interesting because um, I dealt with my um, addiction, my alcoholism, before I dealt with my adoption. And I have to be really honest with you. Um, if it wasn't for just not odd but God things and being in the right place at the right time and hearing what somebody else had to say, listening to somebody else's pain so I could take it on and realize that it, I don't have this pain from it. But if I don't put that extra added little puzzle piece in there, I'm always going to be just not quite right. And um, I, um, there's a wonderful agency in Boston, and uh, it's called uh, um, Home Now. And um, this woman has been working with adopted um, kids. She's seen one, one man 31 years. She's been doing it 40 years. And, uh, you know, I, I, she adopted two kids, and I think her grandmother was adopted. Or her grandmother actually was left on the doorstep of her mother's house or something. So, I mean, it's like one of those. But she, um, she says the whole therapeutic process is very different. Um, you have to start with self and end with self. And, you know, certainly the family of origin comes into play, but you have to be so careful about your family of origin, you know. Um, I know that there was a, one situation that I got involved with where a mother thought it would be a really good idea to call the birth mother to contact the child while she was in treatment mm -hmm. and so that she could work it out. And um, if murder was legal, You'd all have her name. Um, I mean, it's just that I think because I'm not an uh, I'm not an um, an adopted parent. I think that I forget the franticness of uh, of um, unconditional love. You know, my parents certainly loved me, um, but as my mother got Alzheimer's, which I'm <laughs> not sure wasn't a blessing. Um, telling you she used to say things in the nursing home like oh well she was a bad seed until we got a hold of her and um <laughs> I was like as I said less than two weeks old so no matter what you know you, you say no matter how lovely you are in the back of your her brain I know she never dealt with her children's death I know that um she felt like that it was so much more worthy to save somebody else's child because she couldn't save her own. Now, these are all my psychological evaluations of this, but, you know, as I've thought about it a lot, um, uh, my mother and dad had such, I was so righteous. Um, then they had me. Um, and that, that I'm, I'm telling you, the one thing that I knew as a child, you could never lie to my parents because I always got caught. I was the kid that, you know, yep, that was me. Um, and I'm grateful for it, trust me. But, um, you know, for her to say something so outrageous and never talk about it again and never mention it again was so shame-basing for me because I kind of wanted to know, you know, she'd been hit by a car or fell out of a plane or, you know. I, being from Kansas, of course, I thought the big tornado got her and that she was going to come back just like Dorothy. And um, the mind is a wonderful thing. So I have gotten really involved with adoption before addiction and I'm kind of, I think in my 25th year of sobriety, I promised myself that being authentic was what I was going to strive for. Um, and um, 
I've strived to be the best person that uh, I was intended to be, the mom, the wife, the um, friend, uh, the interventionist, whatever has I've been blessed to do. But the one thing that I promised myself was is that I would make everybody astutely aware that we are people like everybody else, but we have little teeny different needs. And um, those needs more than anything just need to be that you are going to be okay and you are okay. Not everybody has the same wonderful story I do. Um, and um, particularly if there's been a lot of uh, people in, you know, that have gone through the foster programs, uh, they are truly throwaway kids. And I met a wonderful psychiatrist whose name is Dr. Sophie, and he is um, an, also an, an addiction doctor, and he got involved in addiction because of all of these foster kids. He just couldn't figure out why they all turned to alcohol and drugs, no matter what. They could be straight A students, they could live in a box, you know, they all um, became afflicted with some type of a disorder that they had to control. And um, um, a lot of those, you know, actions, of course, got them kicked out of houses and thrown away again. And so uh, we've talked a lot about it. And, um, you know, I don't know how deeply psychologically I'll get into all of this. Um, the attachment disorder, the detachment disorder. But um, I just think it's really important for everybody who's in treatment to think seriously about that there is um, a population that come into your treatment or come into your um, world, whether you're a therapist or even an interventionist, that you don't make that a priority with them. Is that it isn't necessarily that they're special, but they feel differently. Um, and it's uh, interesting because uh, there's been six, six of the TV shows that I've done that the kids were adopted. And none of them at, at the beginning and the middle and the end of the show were going to go to treatment. And I pulled out the adoption card. <laughs> and this one um, boy who was from India, who I'll never forget, and... Uh, he was this family's trophy. They claimed they picked him up off the streets of um, Calcutta. Please, you don't just go around like, I'll take him home, put him in your bag. I mean, you know, it was like that's the story he got. And that his mother was a heroin addict. And I want to tell you something. His mother wasn't a heroin addict. His mother um, was a beggar and very, very poor and uh, couldn't feed the six kids. He was one of the last ones, and uh, um, a Christian organization came by and said, we can get a wonderful family. For he wasn't out crawling on the streets at two, which is all the story that he'd been given his whole life. And um, he was a heroin addict because it's the only way he wanted to know how he could relate to his mother. And he wanted to know if he got to be a really bad heroin addict would his family throw him away? And they did. And um, he's not sober today. Um, and what his, I'm just telling you because I hate these people. I'm, um, <laughs> um, his family, while he was in treatment, went back to India. He's never been there. He'd never had curry. He'd never been to an Indian restaurant because they thought it would be recall for him. He was two. He wasn't eating curry. You know, I said he was eating dirt off the sidewalk. Um, didn't have a nice curry chicken dinner, you know. So um, he, because he, they just never allowed him to have his own answers, you know. And they were so furious with me when I brought up the adoption card in the middle of this intervention. I mean, it was like, it didn't have anything to do with it, you know? And he said, 
really, you were adopted? And I said, yeah. And he goes, who adopted you? And I said, these people that raised me. And uh, he said, how did you get adopted? And I said, just like you, they came and chose me, and I went home with them. And he said, uh, do you look like them? And I said, eh. I mean, if you're Irish, you're Irish, you know. But, um, you know, this was a platinum blonde, toe-headed, blue-eyed family who adopted an Indian child. And, uh, you know, the first thing that ever anybody said is, where'd you get him? You know, oh, we swept him off the streets of Calcutta. And um, he, I, you know, I, um, I've stayed in touch with him on and off. And um, his family will absolutely not give him up. You know, he's their um, excuse for being wonderful Christian people and wonderful, lovely people. And look what they've done. And he runs away and they go back and get him because he has no place else to go. And um, I said to him, why don't you get a little can and go out on the street and start, you know, begging and saying, you know, collecting money to get back to India to meet your mother. And because uh, they would never allow him to go back there. And um, he laughed and he said, because uh, I'm afraid of people. I could never ask him for anything. I was, I was actually being funny and he, he took it as a joke. So, you know, I am um, the treatment center that he went to. Um, I don't think that they could deal in any fact with his adoption because we don't have any set way to deal with it. You know, we're all just now coming into all this uh, PTSD and, and all the trauma and the early childhood drama and uh, the drama with the trauma. And, um, you know, I, uh, I think of him so often because I would so love for him to have another opportunity to... Um, to go through treatment on a different level and not have it be about drugs, have it be about him. And uh, um, we'll see. I never, he's above ground and breathing still, so that's the good news. Um, so anyway, that's my story. That's how I got involved with it. Um, I'm hoping to write a book and um, do many different stories. And um, also certainly the, um, the neuro part of this is so important um, to understand and the cognitive part of it and the emotional part of it. And, um, you know, it's not going to be for everybody, but we in the field, um, I truly feel that we so many times miss the littlest things because we get busy, we get full, we get involved and we're focusing on the alcohol and drugs as a dual diagnosis. I mean, that's where it all starts with us, you know. And I hope that all of you that work at treatment centers or our therapists will go home and add a little line at the bottom of your um, sheet that says, um, I was at one point was going to say, do you have a secret you'd like to tell me? But I thought that, no, I wouldn't tell you a secret. Um, um, you know, have you ever been through, yeah you ever been through foster care or are you adopted and then honor that the first day they go in so that they know that they're not different you know it truthfully it's why I felt so compassionate and compelled um, when I got to 12 step because I we all had the same thing I wasn't just this you know and I grew up with a lot of adopted kids I really did and uh, um, all of us are addicts and alcoholics. And out of the 11 that I knew, there's three of us left. All the rest of them died of this disease. And um, two of them of suicide. And um, these were supposed to be well-adjusted, well-cared for, you know, middle to upper class families that I think um, were too afraid to talk about uh, something as important as where did you come from, you know. And so we talk so much about this being a genetic, you know, condition and all of that. And I believe that it is. I don't know if my biological mother was an alcoholic or an addict. Um, and at this point, it, one more time, it doesn't matter because I am. And it saved my life. And it's also given me the ability to share my life with a lot of people and to, uh, and to keep continually learning, you know, learning about myself and learning about other people who suffer. So... 
Where are you, Jonesy? Thanks for asking me to come. I'm so grateful. And I'll take any questions you want. I just uh, <laughs> delivered a small 20-year-old alcoholic who was a big alcoholic and a small child um, last night. And um, uh, she's been watching the show since I think she was 13 or 14. It doesn't look like the same show. I mean, you know, it just doesn't look like it the way it's edited. And there are probably, I mean, the pre-intervention alone is anywhere between five and and four hours, Candy's back there going. And uh, it just, and then when you see it in 44 minutes, it doesn't look the same. Uh, the only, the first time they, this, uh, the crew had spent, uh, I think, uh, 86 hours with her. And when she walked in and saw me, it was the first time she realized it was a show. And she wasn't thrilled to see me. <laughs> you know, I always, my big joke is, is I did one and the girl didn't go. We ended up having to do it on the street, and she called me a effing old bitch. And I went up to her and, you know, I said, don't you ever call me old. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, the rest of it, eh, I'll buy. Um, because, you know, it's, uh, um, I, you know, it's, uh, I guess it's because it's all still supposed to be. I, you know, I have no idea. We've had 200 and... 61,000 families apply to be on that show. And we're on our 154th show. So it's, uh, and to be perfectly honest with you, you know, not everybody that applies is <laughs> telling the truth. And um, if anybody finds out that they're on the show, even while we're out there, we pick up and go home. We've just done that three times in the last three months, you know. They're mic'd all the time, and they forget if the camera isn't there that we can still hear them. So um, I, it's a blessing. I mean, I signed on for it as a joke because I thought, yeah, right. I, my mother-in-law caught me in the bathroom drinking. You know, I wasn't going to let you know a camera crew <laughs> in to watch me lie. Come on, are you kidding me? Um, it's, and I'll tell you, the 99% of the reason that most of these people do it is because they don't want anybody else to have to live with the pain that they have. So. Can you expound a little bit on um, the, the neurological uh, setup or effect in, in an adopted child? Well, there's a... Um, not only a sensory, as far as sense, and a, um, uh, a neuroreceptor connection when you have a child, that it's kind of like um, a animal that had, there's 50,000 penguins, and one penguin goes beep, beep, and he goes, oh, there, that's mine. Um, it's very much the same way. It's a, and a lot of it has to do with smell and sense, it, which is, um, Something, of course, I didn't know anything about it, that it when I started in on this. The other part is a bonding part. And it um, starts with that um, security. It starts with the nurturing, the holding. And it, it, uh, you start being able to count on somebody. Um, it's also very much <coughs> hearing. You recognize people's voices. They certainly know you. They can recognize your mother's voice in the womb. Um, so it all has to do with all of a sudden this, the creator of you um, is no longer around. And even if somebody's holding you and nurturing you and feeding you, you don't have a connection with them as far as a sense, a sensory, or even a hormonal. Um, the hormonal um, connection is, is you never get it back. You never have it with any other person in the whole wide world um, because it breaks this interconnecting um, biological connection that you have from giving birth to a child. And um, when that bond is broken or that's taken away, 
um, you can do just like any orphan animal. You can feed them and put them back together. And, but they're not going to do really well back in the wild. You have to keep them close. And that's kind of how adopted kids are. You, they don't do really well sending them out. And, you know, somebody, this one woman who uh, has adopted three kids, she, at 18, she got the nicest gift she could give them when she got them all their own apartments. They, didn't, they couldn't stand to be there. You know, they didn't, they had no idea how to even connect to themselves. So she had all three kids in these apartments and then they came over and spent the night at her house. And she went over there, I think, probably a lot. So, um, it's, but it's, um, it's a biochemical thing that just like, as I said, with no matter how many animals you have out in the forest that are the same, that smell, that sound, you can always identify you know, your child, and it's exactly the same way with humans. It's just a lot more sensory and um, biological than I thought it was, you know. All right, Andy, thank you for all that. I didn't realize you're into the adoption thing. I was adopted. Uh, of course you are. Out of New York. Um, New York is one of those states that will never release any information. You're right. I will never know anything about uh, my adopted parents. I know very, very little just what my dad can remember, but um, my uh, now ex-wife and I uh, adopted and were there in an open adoption, were there when he was born. And I have to say that the moment he crowned, I couldn't imagine loving anything that much. And I couldn't, and to this day, and he's now 14, I can't imagine loving him any less, or any more, I'm sorry, if, if he were my own blood. And our, But you were present for that initial right, bonding. Our bond it's just, it feels biological. It feels, it runs very, very, very deep. Perhaps I'm more bonded to him as a result of that than he is to me. Um, but we have a lot of closeness, as he does with his, you know, my Does wife. your son know you're adopted? Uh, oh, yeah, sure. And so that's like, he and I have that kind of, we're like, you know, father and son, but we're also brothers in adoption as well. So. It's actually really neat, and uh, right. I felt like uh, you know the circle has kind of been uh, been completed by that. But the How fortunate you are! Very, very interesting, which you brought up, uh, because in my own case, you know, growing up, uh, you know, I met you and I are close to the same age, and back when I was a child, it was a, there was a real stigma attached to it. I mean, a real stigma attached to being adopted, and I really felt like an outsider, which I believe you know contributed a lot to my feelings of isolation and alienation, which ultimately, you know. Well, it's the same exact, so you're a recovering alcoholic. Oh, hey. Yeah. Oh, so when you, when you were five years, well, when, but yeah. when you were five years old and you just talked about the isolation, the right. difference, the shame, all of that, all the that's where it first started. Yeah, absolutely. Even before you ever took a drink. And then absolutely. when I came into 12-step, the first thing I heard was, oh, that was alcoholic thinking when I had to realize it was, for me, it was the adoptive process of thinking that swiftly moved into the other. Yeah, oh, I, oh, I'm thrilled to death. Oh, you wait till we have to have all these sperm donors that want to go out and find their kids. know that he has the addiction problem. Now his biological mother has come into his life and he's hiding the addiction from her. From he's her. hiding his addiction from his biological he mom? He's dating not know he's in treatment and in fact he left a couple days ago because his biological mother um, contacted him. We allowed him a few minutes a day by cell phone and he got a text message and she and her husband were flying into Colorado to take him to a football game. Well, he probably wouldn't have left except for the opportunity to, to see where he belongs, you know. Well, yeah, it's true. He met with them and he was just totally trying to hide the fact from them that he had an addiction. That's not going to last long. He'll be back in treatment, but 
or he'll really make them crazy when he shows up for the football game. Well, most people in this day and age, it was very different when I got adopted in the 40s, but most people um, can have their own children by surrogate or by in vitro or whatever it is. So it isn't your, but when I was adopted, it, it was a desperation. You either couldn't have kids, which is a shame-based thing for a woman, or you got caught and it was a shame-based thing for a woman and you, but in, in a lot of situations with women my age, they never had the decision whether they could keep their child or not. Their parents gave them up for adoption because they weren't going to ruin their life. So I, I think that um, my parents were in their, my mom was in her early 30s. My dad was uh, about 35, and I was um, 32 years old when I, 31, almost 32, when I gave birth to my first child. So I think that... Um, I think it just depends on where you are in your life. I mean, if you find out very, very early, you know, that you can't have kids, I imagine that you would adopt. Um, but um, I don't think that the bonding age has much to do with it, as much as the surrendering unto yourself that how lucky you are to have this child. No. I mean, you know, I just can tell you that's what I had to do. But when I was 10 years sober, I uh, went to a program uh, called The Survivors at the Meadows, and it's how you survive your childhood. And um, I was infuriated about having to go to it to be a referent there. And uh, this guy's the first guy that ever said abandonment to me. It wasn't a good thing. And um, I had to act nice because they were like scholarshipping me. So um, it was one of those things where if I had never had that opportunity to truly realize that I had to start there, I mean, I was already sober, but um, there were so many unanswered questions. I mean, I truly just took what everybody else said as my truth, and it wasn't always that way, you know. Um, there, is, there wasn't any alcoholism in my um, adopted parents and and uh, so there was a lot more shame involved in it for me and you know I always thought well there was well you know that's probably why they gave her up you know it was that kind of but that so much of that is in the child I mean I think you certainly have to it's no different than having a dual diagnosis do you treat you know the bipolar you know it's the horse before the cart I think they I think that you will miss an opportunity to have them have a full life if you don't do it at the same time, you know. Um, and uh, I think a lot of it is trauma, so I think you can maybe start with that. You know, it doesn't have anything to do with shame or blame. It has to do with the, the what's the best therapy to make you the happiest, you know. No, because I don't know if my um, my birth mother was an alcoholic. But I know that the ACA program is opening stuff up to uh, those who are an alcoholic and dysfunctional family. Well, but I, I didn't come from a dysfunctional family. I came from a wonderful, wonderful family. I made the family dysfunctional. So I can't go and start complaining about them when it was me, you know. There actually are 12-step programs that have to do with adoption and 12-step, but um, I uh, I just got to be a drunk. <laughs> I just, you know, I just, that same thing about, you know, am I going to be the wife of a musician? Am I going to be going to my... I mean, I could find a million different um, 
programs to go to and probably could certainly stand all of them but you know when I'm candy alcoholic I'm at my best so I you know I'm gonna be candy alcoholic adopted and I'm gonna be old and then I'm gonna be you know so it's uh, um, but I, I would think if you were a younger person it would be wonderful to be with some other people who you know had the same thing going on you did but I, that's what I'm talking about, getting it helpfully done in treatment instead of having to go out and, and uh, have your whole fifth step <laughs> be about these people, you know? That you, you know. But open adoptions are very, very different. You know, they're very different. And uh, I've seen some of them that are miraculous, and I've seen some of them that were nightmares. You know, the minute that the kid finds a biological, then the adopted mother and father is so incensed that they, they want to go meet all these people and be a part of them. And, and it becomes like, you know, um, the Hatfields and McCoys, boy, I, you know, I've really seen it be just a mess. And the kid doesn't have any idea what's going on. So. I was really touched by all this. I, too, um, am a uh, product of adoption. And I'm just wondering, are there any treatment centers that exist right now that deal with the adoption and the addiction as dual diagnosis? Um, well, the um, uh, Fulcher Ranch in, in New Haven and Sunrise, but it's adolescents and, and young adult women. Um, and they actually adjust a lot better. This guy happened to, you know, do really well. He was rather well adjusted. And, yeah, no, but I'm just saying women, because a lot of women have their own children, so they create their own families and quickly and young. And so... It, they, they don't seem to be as traumatized a lot as the boys, but um, no, but, you know, I'm looking for that place because um, I think it's important. I think it's important that uh, we, just like anything else, you know, we can go and talk about it with other people that, that uh, you know, that uh, feel the same way we do. I mean, that's a magical thing about 12 Step, and then on top of it. Now, there are adoption support groups, wonderful ones that I know of and uh, all of that, that are a, a part of AAC is what it's called, Association of, of uh, Adoption um, Congress. And you can go on there and they're, they're, I'm telling you, they are busy, busy, busy people. And um, they have support groups for all different levels of adoption. Thank you very much. Thank you, Josie. <laughs>